Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining me for service today. Over the past few weeks, it's been very, very busy in the diocese as many of us wait to see what the government allows us to do. And the closer we get to that, the more we wonder what it is that we should be doing and how we are ever going to be able to gather together in worship. That's the question that I've been asked to focus on today in the sermon. But you know, over these past few weeks, I have become more and more aware of the blessing that our church is, the blessing that our people are, the faithfulness of our church and diocesan family, and also of a new hope for the future. So as we gather today, we are going to offer God a service of thanksgiving and prayers for our parishes and for our lives of faith. As you are able, as you are led, please join in the singing of the opening hymn, We Love the Place, O God. Alleluia! Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia! May his grace and peace be with you. May he fill our hearts with joy. Almighty God, watchful and caring, our source and our end, all that we are and all that we have are yours. Accept us now as we give thanks to you for every holy place and time where we have come to praise your name, to ask your forgiveness, to know your healing power, to hear your word, and to be nourished by the body and blood of your Son. Be present always to guide and to judge, to illumine and to bless your people. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I ask you now to join with me in a remembrance of our baptism, in the way God calls us and commissions us and equips us for living and for ministry. We thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of water. Over water, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. Through water, you led the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt 
into the land of promise. In water, your son, Jesus, received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah, the Christ, to lead us through his death and resurrection from the bondage of sin into everlasting life. We thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. By it, we share in his resurrection. Through it, we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we celebrate our fellowship in him, in faith, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for the proclamation of the word, Almighty God, your eternal word speaks to us through the words of Holy Scripture. We have read of your mighty acts and purposes in history and have learned about those whom you have chosen to be agents of your will. Inspired by the revelation of your Son, we seek your present purposes. Give us ears to hear and hearts to obey. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Here is the reading that I have chosen for us today. It's from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him shall never be put to shame. This is the word of the Lord. Almighty God, we have heard your words to us in Holy Scripture and know your call to each of us. In every age you have spoken through the voices of prophets, pastors, and teachers. We give you thanks that over the years we have heard you speak to us through the preaching of your word. Grant that those who preach wherever we gather may proclaim the crucified and risen Christ and interpret your word with sensitivity and insight, that we may hear that word inwardly and respond to it in all our life. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. Blessings, friends. The question I was asked to consider this week had to do with the kind of church that I think we are going to become as the world tries to recover from COVID-19, specifically from our people. Um, the question is sort of wrapped around their own lives and of course, wondering what's going to happen to our churches. What kind of church are we going to have in the future? I think that's a great question to reflect uh, the many different questions that people are asking today. I know that both laity and clergy are asking it. I've been in meeting after meeting, all online, across the country, across the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, with our parishes, with our clergy, with our regional deans, with individuals who want to talk, but 
didn't want to come to the office or couldn't come to the office. Meeting after meeting after meeting. I see the tired faces of our clergy and our people. And I know that question about the church is much, much deeper than concerns about routines, about worship, about finances, about buildings, about pretty every much outward expression of who we are as a people, deeper questions. That's why everyone's so tired, exhausted. That's why fuses are getting short, and that's why we're reacting in different ways to the things that one time didn't bother us at all. So ask yourself with me, what are your questions really about? What keeps you up at night? How are you doing? Do you believe that someone cares about you? I hear people say all the time, you know, I'm not really all that worried, but I'm exhausted for some reason. Of course you are. The center of gravity of everyday life has shifted. Things that bother you, um, one time didn't. They seem, things that were unimportant at one time are driving you crazy. As I say, things that never bother you are beginning to push down on your thoughts, your spirit, your patience. Now, in regard to the church, it's pretty obvious that the ongoing work of the physical church has been hampered. We have not been permitted to gather. We cannot share meals. And we can't hug each other. We can't hug people who are tired. You know those special moments when a hug is not only appropriate, it's necessary. When a, a prayer off the cuff is not only appropriate, it's absolutely necessary. That eye-to-eye -eye touch, smile that you can almost feel as well as see. We can't hug those who are tired and sick and grieving. We can't provide the outward signs which are sacramental and healing for each other. We always knew, we still know, as clergy and laity, that the things we do without words were far more powerful than any words we can offer on our own. We have found ourselves having nothing left but words that we must use on our own. In regard to your clergy, brothers and sisters, many of them have found that all the things that they were good at and put their hearts into have been taken away day by day thought by thought, prayer by prayer, they keep trying, and they will keep trying. Why? Because of their love for you, the people of God. They do it because of the vows they made to serve Jesus and the people of God. It's been hard for our clergy, like you. It's hard for clergy sometimes to, to own up to this, because we're not supposed to own up to being tired or weak or, or unavailable or stressed out or unsure. It's been hard for them, because like you, they have many questions. What kind of questions, you might ask? What do the leaders in my parish think I am doing now that I cannot lead public worship during this pandemic? 
How can I explain to the leaders the things that the bishop is telling us that we have to do? With all of these changes, do my people still realize that I love them, how much I pray for them, and how I long to be with them? Do my people understand the weight of the responsibility that I feel for my churches and for my diocese and for the vows that I've made as a priest? With all of these changes, do my people and leaders see the actual work that I am doing still? With all these changes, what's going to happen to our church? How will these people view God? And by extension, as an ordained minister of the church, how are people going to see me and my role? With all of these changes and all the, the challenges we know are coming, how are we ever going to figure out what to do? With all these changes, what new challenges are we going to have to face in life? And how can I, as a priest, serve my people when all the things that were comfortable and comforting have been challenged? And we now see that the government is able to put a stop on pretty much everything that we do. Do my people see how tired and I'm certain I might be at this moment, how much I need them. My people care for me. I know that some of these questions connect with you. One of the things that I'm doing, and I have done, as you know, recently released the document and the video informing our diocese that we are not planning on opening our services before September 6th. And you might say, well, Bishop John, the government's moving faster, they're moving faster, they're moving faster. Why don't you? Why don't we? Well, my job is to listen to the voice, the voices, the many voices, and figure out what it is that we need to do as a diocese for the good of our churches, for the good of our people, and for the good of our clergy. As we move through the alert stages, we're seeing a wide variety of responses to things that are being said, not just in Newfoundland, but right across the country. And we just don't know what the government is going to, to allow us to do, or what they're going to take away from us. And the other thing is, too, we do not know what it is they expect us to do when we start worshiping. Right now, our diocese is, is sourcing prices on personal protection equipment, uh, trying to figure out what we can say to churches when the government tells us that everybody has to wash their hands when they come in. Uh, you're not allowed to use hymn books. You're not allowed to use uh, service bulletins. You're not allowed to use paper of any sort. Uh, you may not be allowed to take communion anyway. You know, uh, how many times a, a doorknob has to be sanitized? It's done every time someone opens a door. Um, and they're telling us that, that to expect regulations, strict controls. We have no idea what they're going to be. So ask your bishop. I have had the privilege and the exhausting responsibility of listening to the voices, reading the ways, and discerning what is best for our diocese our clergy, and our people. Senate office staff is constantly reaching out to, to connect with the government, to connect with people, and to make sure that we are on point when it comes to any new information. So I'm asking you to trust. Trust that God is leading us through this that the Holy Spirit is working through this tired old bishop, but your bishop is confident, secure, hopeful, and filled with the Holy Spirit. We are going to be a different church. Our worship, our gatherings, 
and our physical expressions are sure going to be different. We are going to have to redirect our focus in some ways. Reset our priorities, perhaps. We need one thing for sure. is to move into a commitment to trust Jesus. I was thinking about prayer, about study, about our environment and about the movement of the Spirit of God is about to enter a new phase. It's not all bad, is it? Not all bad? Not at all. We are on the way to a deeper place in our relationship with the living God. How can we not look forward to that? How can we keep from singing? Your lives, brothers and sisters, are never going to be the same. We haven't quite realized all of that yet. Because the changes that are going to happen in our society and around us, in our hometowns and in our families, are going to be like dominoes falling. Some will fall, some won't. Our lives are never going to be the same. But we can trust that God is able and that God will be with us. You may remember that incredibly long sermon I preached at my first synod. Boy, I was really trying hard. But the essence was, we are like the people of Israel standing on the shore of the Red Sea. We had nowhere to go except forward. And before us is darkness and waves but we step forward in faith, knowing, believing, hoping that the waters will part. That's what's happening for us. Our church, I believe, is moving into a whole new, exciting time. Trust that God is able. And in our diocese, it's going to be okay to take our time. Please continue to support your churches financially. You've been doing a fantastic job. Of all the dioceses across the country, I'm not supposed to brag as a Christian. Our level of stewardship is absolutely phenomenal. And it needs to improve because the diocese itself is carrying the financial load. Just stay with us. Let's not walk away. Let's renew our commitments. Let's be aware. So, let me say this to you. Your clergy need to know that you love them. They need you to understand how stressed and tired they are. Our clergy need to know that they are loved and needed and wanted. They don't need to hear talk about uh, not doing anything, sitting around all day, because they're not. They're working hard. They don't need to hear talk about laying people off. Remember in your parish, the role of, of the, the envelope is to support a ministry, no matter what that looks like. Placing your envelope in the offering or presenting it to the church is not about you uh, paying an employee at the church. You are supporting a ministry. And your administrative um, pastor has to do things differently. We need them now more than ever. Now our clergy need time to be free from the burden of the stress of wondering. They need time to regenerate. And that's part of our plan as a diocese. I, I've asked our clergy to plan the rest of the summer for relaxation, refreshment, you know, recreation. So so that when, when they get back to their parishes, and of course they never really leave them anyway, they can start thinking about a plan that fits every single congregation when we can reopen. And as soon as I get the information from the government, we're going to join all that together, and we are going to be ready to go. So I ask you to support that. 
And remember that they will be developing, they are, most of them already are, developing plans for your parish, but it will it will not, it cannot be complete until I have gathered all the information we need, and I will, just as soon as it is provided to me, and then we will move forward. It's going to be an exciting time. What a wonderful church we have. And the Spirit is calling us into the light. All of us in this diocese are pulling together, working together, and praying together. Now, I know this sermon is longer than normal, but not, not by a whole lot. Uh, I want you to think, as I bring this to a close, about, about that reading from Peter. Us Newfoundlanders usually end up in the beach sometime in the summer or the fall, whatever you're looking for. The beach is just a place that draws us. When you walk upon the beach, what do you see? besides kelp and driftwood. One of the things that are very common on beaches that are not too sandy are stones. And if you pick them up and look at them, they're not sharp edged, are they? They're round. They're roughly the same size. They've been tossed to and fro and to and fro for millennia. And they've been worn down by the tumbling and the relentless motion of the sea. Stones. Now imagine yourself picking up a pile of them and saying, I'm going to stack these stones and build me a house. I'm going to do it all by myself. You can't. They're round. They'll fall off. They won't stay together because they, they've been worn down so much that on their own, they can't adhere. They can't stack. They can't do hardly anything. And you know what? Peter chose that analogy very carefully. It's we are like them stones, living stones who are weary and worried and wandering and tossed about until we're well-rounded and old, have no edge left. God says, do gather up them stones, living stones. Bring them to me. Consecrate them to me. And I'll provide them order. And together, we will build a house. And it won't be my house won't be your house. It will be our house. So brothers and sisters, be aware. We're praying for you. We love you. And we thank God for you. Let's have a prayer. Lord, we don't know what our lives will be like in the future. We know we're headed for change. And in that moment of, of admitting perhaps our weariness, our uncertainty, or even our excitement, and admitting who we are before you, we ask your blessing. We ask you to draw us together, living stones. Help us overcome the fear of the, the different ideas. Help us to be humble enough to listen caring enough to respect and trusting that not only will our church do well in the future, but you will provide us with meaning and healing and hope. Bless my brothers and sisters now, Lord. I ask it in Jesus' holy name. Please join in the singing, as you are able, of Thy Hand, O God, Has Guided.
Shall we spend some time in prayer? I know many of you are thinking about the places where you worship. And there are also many people who are worshiping with us here today who do not attend a building for worship regularly. Let's thank God for the spirit that is drawing all people together and give thanks for each other here in this virtual location. I remind you as we pray that the word virtual for us means that we are online. Sometimes the word virtual means it's not real or it's not true. But believe me, brothers and sisters, our gathering here on the internet is true, it's sincere, and it's very real. So we pray for the Church Universal, of which our buildings are an outward symbol. We thank you, Lord. We pray for the Church Universal, the Church that is visible as we love one another in our daily lives. We thank you, Lord. For your presence whenever two or three have gathered in your name, we thank you, Lord. For each place, for each time, for each moment where we may be still and know that you are God. We thank you, Lord. For the fulfilling of our desires and petitions as you see best for us, we thank you, Lord. For our past and a vision of the future that lies ahead, we thank you, Lord. For the gift of the Holy Spirit, for our new life in baptism, we thank you, Lord. For the pardon of our sins, when we have fallen short of your glory, we thank you, Lord. For the Holy Eucharist, in which we have a foretaste of your eternal kingdom, we thank you, Lord. For the blessing of our vows, and the crowning of our years with your goodness, we thank you, Lord. For the faith of those who have gone before us and for our encouragement by their perseverance, we thank you, Lord. For all the benefactors of our faith who have died, for those who are in the peace of Christ and are now at rest. We thank you, Lord. As we think about the fellowship of all your saints, Lord, we take a moment now to bring before you our own personal needs, petitions, the names of those who have asked us to pray for them. Lord, send your healing power upon your people. We thank you, Lord. O God, from living and chosen stones, you prepare an everlasting dwelling place for your majesty. Grant that in the power of the Holy Spirit, those who serve you here may always be kept within your presence. This we pray. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Father, hear the prayers of your faithful people. Grant that all who celebrate our faith and church may please you by the offering of themselves to the fulfilling of your will. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. Our final hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation.